This is a scary story. A traditional horror story with a haunted house, a monster, and unflinching violence. But there's something else here too. We're talking about Everything the Darkness Eats by Eric LaRocca with narrator Andre Santana on this Desideratum. A desideratum is an essential thing. I'm audiobook narrator Teresa Bakken, talking about how stories are essential, both the art of telling and the journey of listening. This week's episode is sponsored by Dreamscape Media, an independent, award-winning audiobook publisher. Dreamscape produces a wide range of titles, from motivational self-help to mysteries, thrillers, and happily ever afters. I hope you'll visit their website, dreamscapepublishing.com, and sign up for their weekly newsletter for audiobook deals and updates on their regular audiobook giveaways. You can also connect with Dreamscape on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Okay, let's get on with the story. We've got a small town in Connecticut, and there's something a little sinister happening. Yeah. And in the first few chapters, we also learn, um, in a way that the other characters don't, that it's also something a little magical. And our very um, curious kind of quote-unquote central character ghost, who I think has the most interesting energy for me because there's something about the way the writing happens around a ghost and very conveniently, uh, you know, about his name that that makes me sometimes feel like uh, almost like he's dead, mm. you know? And that's not that's not really a component of the story, but just in terms of like, someone who's who's navigating through life with so much question yeah and kind of so much hesitation and i think that that disposition leads him into some interesting scenarios in the story yes you know i i'm always curious about character names and that had not occurred to me so the character you're talking about ghost has lost his fiance, his pregnant fiance, mm-hmm. in this tragic accident. We learned that very early in the book about him. So he is kind of a shell yeah. of a person. And typical for horror, for that genre, he has his own sort of demon or spirit uh, sort of haunting him. Mm-hmm. So there's this component to his character that's sort of like always speaking ill uh, in his ear, right? Um, again, it's a little bit magic, you yeah. know, it's compelling. And he, you're, you're right, he is kind of the main protagonist in the story, even though there are these dual um, storylines happening. He's kind of heartachingly real. I think that's what you were just explaining. He's very, you have compassion for him instantly. And that's one of the things I think that Eric LaRocca has done well. So it's horror. There's some occult, there's some unexplained, like some of the fear comes from the unknown unexplained, but also there's fear that has to do with just a uh, fear of death, which is our classic yeah. horror. As you were creating the characters uh, as the narrator, you're playing all of these characters. Yeah, yeah. Like you instantly sort of took us to the heart of one of them, Yeah. but you have to have empathy for all of them. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you do that? I think for me, this is a really interesting question because I've had a couple titles where, less the case for this one, but a couple titles where the premise is ridiculous and the characters fully accept the premise and they're still clearly written as fully fleshed out people. And I think for me, I feel like characters are, when we narrate them, we have to meet them. and. I have a really vivid visualization and I love I love how that carries me through audiobooks and helps me kind of experience moments. But if I sit down with a ghost, for example, and I think of, again, um, someone who's quite literally navigating, you know, with his demons on his shoulder who are constantly s- encouraging him to speak down on himself, mm-hmm. who is living through this recent grief. I think the moment that I meet these characters it's hard to not see them as people, as kind of like fully fleshed up people. Um, And so 
especially here in third person, since we're in third person um, and I get to be a uh, kind of opinionated third person narrator, um, I've met these people and I get to I get to share my empathy. I don't have to hold back that empathy in the narration. And and we see that with, you know, some of the the, the very brutal scenes in this book is that the benefit for me was not having to have to hold back my empathy because there there was an empathetic relationship that the third person narration has to the telling of these stories. That's a very good point. That even when you're in the most broken and brutal of scenes, mm. you have a tiny level of distance. Yeah. yeah. Right? Um, from your perspective. Was there anything that was really challenging about this? living this story and we can say there's some unflinching violence in it what is what is that like for you to step into that story and then how do you also mm. step back out of it yeah yeah um i think what's interesting for me is eric laraca is very publicly um a queer writer yes and in in some way each of these characters um identifies as queer each of these three characters that we follow and so I think it's really interesting to be able to say, you know, like there are so many contexts in which uh, watching queer people navigate these kinds of like brutal experiences is not what I'm searching for, you know, in terms of narration or storytelling or what I'm personally looking for. And then in another way, it's also interesting to say, ah, like here's kind of an opportunity to examine this really navigated well and intentionally with queer characters in this context. And so I think for me, part of the challenge was finding a balance, especially when we are kind of with the perpetrators of pain in these scenes. Mm -hmm. You know, so many of, of, those, of those scenes that um, contain so much brutality um, that really, you know, are the the central horror of the story. Do not keep from us what makes the perpetrators human as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what's hooking me down as I narrate. And I think for me, when I like when I step out of the booth, part of it is just the beauty of forgetting. Um, part of it for me, I think, is I walk out and walk away and also get to say again, like, here's something that is going to be a really interesting exploration of these queer characters in a horror setting that doesn't shy away from how their queerness intersects with the thing that's pulling them into this story. Yes. Yes. I think that that is what Eric is known for, uh, even though this is his first, this is his debut novel format. Yeah. He has done a lot in novella and short, but taking this really ancient genre right? We can go back to folklore and, you know, we have been telling horror stories um, forever. And he brings a modernity to it. In I love what you just said about an intersection, right? Like there's, and there's also something I think very topical about mm. the horror that you just said, the real horror in this, because we're also talking about an occult. Yeah. The storyline has to do with something mystical that's definitely got flavors of like evil monster, like those monster themes. But then the real monsters, the real horror and fear is how he has woven something really topical about the brutal hatred, bigotry, homophobia that's happening in this small town. And it starts with just like hate speak, yeah. right? Like the first little crime is a brick through a window. Um, and there's a discomfort with that, you know, to read something like that. But it so quickly escalates into violence. And I think that is, for me, that is what made this a unique horror story for today. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's why people are drawn to horror, right? That we do sort of, we do sort of brush up against our fears, to feel them, to know what they are. Yeah. Uh, and this definitely, uh, for a group of people, really brushes up against what's most scary. I think. Yeah, and I think part of part of this this novel for me is that when I look at the magical elements, they often feel like really apt metaphors, you know, one that's 
obviously revealed early on, of course, as ghost and his literal demon on his shoulder and his ear, you know, speaking to him. Um, and the, for me that, you know, and I, I literally do say for me, there is no kind of like the author has revealed this to me. It's truly just how I've internalized it was that was really about internalized homophobia, um, internalized self-hatred. And so kind of each of these magical elements has some uh, kind of real life parallel for me. And it's what makes this book to me a book about how hatred eats everything. It eats us and it eats the people around us. Mm. So I think that's what that's what for me was really, you know, I haven't narrated anything like this before. And that's what for me was really compelling about it. Yes. It is not a genre that I'm typically drawn to. And like you said, you haven't been, nothing's been revealed to you from the author. And we're we're kind of speaking for Eric a little bit. But I think I think sometimes we shy away from things that are like, well, that's not a story for me. And yet there's still, I I just think the more stories there are, the more, the more voices telling those stories, the richer the experience of taking in story can be. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. I think um, what perfectly undergirds this whole piece too, is that like, you know, Eric, Eric writes with a little bit of mastery. <laughs> like the the prose is really wonderful, yes. you know, and um, is a really stark contrast to some of the things being described throughout the course of the book. And so I think having that as a kind of um, grounding component as well, like through through the reading of this book is really something and, and does make me kind of think about this. And this, this may be like really strong for folks who don't have a lot of experience with horror. Yeah. Um, but in in its own way, in the ways that we're talking about, is is a compelling kind of introduction to what the genre can do. Yes. One of the things I wondered about for you is one of the classic parts of horror is this building. Like it's why people are attracted to it. I think we get this anticipation, anticipation, anticipation. And this story definitely, this double-edged sword is happening and there's trauma we know it's building towards something. And that, I think, is really challenging in narration. So I wondered how you found the energy for that, how you, as an audio storyteller, were able to execute, obviously, his plan as an author. Yeah. One big thing for me is, um, you know, early on in my uh, narration journey, I was really fortunate to be able to take um, acting for audio with Joel Frumkin. And one of his big kind of takeaways for me was balancing kind of the intention of the story's genre with the tone that you use throughout. That if I started from the top and went all the way through the end of the book of like, I have this really like terrified tone and we're always tense all the time, it would be way too overwhelming. Yes. And so I think for me, um, Especially when the writing is so strong, I think that there's a truth in the text at any given moment. And if I'm sitting with that truth, then I'm going to find what energy that kind of section calls for. Mm. And so, you know, we we do start off on a strong tone with that really interesting scene at this excavation site. And there's a little bit of kind of a, a peek at the horror to come. Yes. And then we're just kind of calmly sitting with Ghost. And... What's what's really interesting here is that we have three simultaneous storylines. And so it's not just a, you know, kind of rise to the climax of drama and drop. And it's not even a, a, a double kind of like, you know, every other chapter we're seeing from another character, we're following three kind of stories, really. And so there's a lot of um, wonderful kind of like tension rise and then tension drop and rise again. And it's all orchestrating to the end of our story. Um, And so I think as long as I'm feeling connected and finding what the tone and energy is of the chapter I'm in, um, the the energy of the story kind of tells itself in that way. Yes, and I think even people listening right now can hear that you um, you have a quality in your natural speaking voice that is, there's just a soothing quality. It's just light and lovely. And so I think one of the things I really loved about hearing you narrate this very dark story is that that is a contrast that only someone with your sort of vocal qualities can bring to it. 
and it almost amplifies it. Like the moment where we go into the haunted house with one of the elderly people that's been kidnapped, um, her sort of discovery of it. Miss Childers crawled out of the idling car and followed Mr. Crowley up the front steps and into the foyer. Her head swiveled this way and that as she entered, her eyes darting from expensive-looking furniture, likely imported from the Orient, to the taxidermy heads of wild beasts from exotic expeditions decorating the walls. You're a really interesting choice. Yeah, so there's actually a really funny story because um, this, you know, is produced through Dreamscape, and this was one of the few titles that they actually put up onto their kind of like audition portal. Mm -hmm. And I saw it, um, I recognized the author from, you know, previous work, having seen them online, and so I submitted the audition, and for me, it really was like like something something delicate. It didn't, you know, I've I've narrated stories in like a, a baritone register where it's kind of a gruffer approach and a different character. Um, the the audition scene was Ghost going to the hospital in that first chapter and just talking with the nurse and having that, you know, devil speaking in his shoulder, mm-hmm. and there really was just something very kind of like so delicate about it, you know, that if, if the story is, if we've got these like claws that are going to come and rip out at, at your shoulder, you know, something really intense like that. It really just felt like a scene of like, like a light scrape, like a, just a soft moment. And so I, I went with that and the producer stopped me at the Audis, um, Eric Black, to just say like that he was also kind of like, he said he wouldn't have thought of me for this kind of story. And like I said, I haven't narrated anything like this, um, but the style really resonated with the author. And so we kind of landed where we landed. So I think I think that's really cool because it, for me, it speaks to the fact that like audiobook narration is interpretation. Yes. You know, you're going to give the same audiobook to 10 different people. You're going to get 10 different audiobooks. Yes. And so I, I'm i just really grateful that we got to kind of play around with this, like, interesting story in that way. Yes. That it it definitely, it probably stretched you as an actor. Oh, yeah. That it, it took you in a direction that you hadn't gone before. Yeah. I love that. And I love that the producer even said, well, actually, frankly, when you put your audition in, it resonated in a way. That's one of the things that's hard, I think, for people outside of narration to understand that you do a lot of auditions and you can think, oh, I'm a great fit for this in the audition process. But there's a real peace in knowing that if you get selected, you're the right voice for it. And if you don't, you weren't. (laughs) But you're a very interesting choice for this. And I think think you do a a beautiful job of it. It's very, um, it's chilling. It was then she noticed other religious relics decorating the space. Iron crucifixes studded with various kinds of expensive jewelry, glass sun catchers hanging from the ceiling and painted with various scenes of holy iconography. Miss Childers' breathing slowed until it was a mere whisper. Just then, she noticed Mr. Crowley was staring at her, gleefully taking in her bemusement. There's something I have to tell you, he said, approaching her. She sensed her knees quiver, threatening to give way as he closed in on her. Things are quite different here, he explained. Then he commanded her gauze-wrapped hand. She gave it to him without comment, merely watching as he unspooled the dressing. Her hand was stripped bare in a matter of seconds, the small wound pouting at her. Mr. Crowley pressed down inside the palm of her hand, a dark thread drooling from the small hole there. Ms. Childers swayed back and forth, threatening to collapse. But Mr. Crowley seized her before she could topple, holding her tight in his arms. Watch, he said to her. There are religious overtones in this also. Yeah, yeah. Again, that's classic horror that he's woven into this. Yeah. And I think the part for me uh, about this book that kind of feels like the runaway train, and, you know, I'm trying to formulate this in a way that doesn't reveal too much, is that 
the way that religion plays into this book um, really, for me, is further metaphor. It really underscores this challenging relationship that I think queer people, queer communities often have with religion. And I feel that the the use of it here is really fascinating because there's some components later on in the story where, you know, it's very specifically relevant. But even early on, when um, we've we've got um, you know our kind of villainous character coming through and uh, you know weaseling people away uh, and disappearing them, there's uh, you know one thing that we see established early as a pattern for him is using people's desperation against them to make them come with him. Yes, and I think that there is something very religious about that desperation that all these characters have different relationships to religion and there's still a a bit of fall to your knees right for them when they are faced with the possibility of what he's offering them part of that commentary um again um my my thought that i mentioned earlier about how you know hatred can eat us from the inside and can eat everything around us um I think that for some people, there is a truth that they are turning away from. And in their lives, they utilize religion as the beautiful picture of a window that they are convinced that they are looking out of. It really isn't religion. It really is something behind it. It's, I think, that truth of what people escape to is is really what's being analyzed here. And so I think that's that's one thing that's really fascinating about this story, too. I think what you just said about playing on people's desperation is a really important point, because the victims that are being disappeared are uh, older and lonely mm. and seeking, seeking some connection, and that makes them vulnerable. And that's also just, again, I think horror plays on so many different fears. And that's just one more fear that I think is a very human, easy to identify with, fear of Fear of being alone, of being forgotten. Mm. He plays with that with those characters. Yeah, there's so many different, there's so many things to be afraid of in this book, right? He's He explores so many different fears. As someone who is not necessarily a student of horror, I really tried to think after I read it of how adeptly he played with all the different elements of the genre. Yeah. And that was impressive. That was impressive. Um, Okay. I did want to talk a little bit about you. I wrote down that you're Mm -hmm. Brazilian-born, but that you were raised some on the West Coast. Now you're on the East Coast. Um, One of the most interesting things to me in your bio was what you studied in college. Can you talk a little bit about what what you studied? Yeah, absolutely. So when I went to college, I kind of quickly fell in love with psychology. And so I finished almost all the requirements for that in my first two years and added on, um, I went to a school where we could self-design our majors. And so I created a major called biosocial studies, which was biology and sociology. Um, And with the three of them, my senior thesis was around queer identity development. So I did a, a study and then also kind of a literature analysis. I spent a lot of time thinking about how people become themselves. Um, and so I think that's been a kind of interesting background to my to my acting work. Yeah, that's fascinating. I think anything in the psychology realm, too, is just very helpful for the kind of acting that audiobook narration requires. I think one of some of the best narrators that I listen to, I feel like you forget that it's all one person while you're listening, yeah. right? you You are lost in the different characters that they've created so that you're sitting with multiple people in your ear and that those are the most transcendent um, performances. And there's a component of, of that kind of psychology and figuring that out, right. And learning how to perform that. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think, you know, I I was mentioning earlier about kind of my process of feeling like I want to meet the characters that I'm narrating. And I think that really is um, a part of it is especially when there is a scene that feels like it's, introducing a lot of complicated factors. There's a lot of subtext. We're exploring, again, not to reveal too much, but there is there was one particular scene for me that very much was that, 
you know, in uh, everything The Darkness Eats. It was set in a bathtub, if you'll remember that particular scene. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's really hard for me to feel like I'm sitting down and giving my best performance if I don't believe that it's coming from a place of honesty, even with challenging characters. I feel it's a, a really wonderful privilege in the scope of audiobook narration to just sit and think about how they got to that scene, how they arrived in that moment. Um, because I'm not going to change it. I didn't write the book. I can't, I can't reverse the course of their life. But I think that, that we have so many, you know, beautiful kind of encounters that we get to, we get to narrate in audiobooks. And so why not arrive to them fully equipped to, to tell the truth of that moment? Yes, that's really, I love the way you just described that. I think there's something about the audio industry that feels extremely inclusive. There's a value to finding the right voice. Yeah. There's a value to elevate the stories, uh, bring more of those stories to light. I, I think it's been a wonderful, it's been wonderful to see so much more of, of that like representation and just opportunity to tell stories. Um, you know, uh, before the audience happened, I went on to the Wikipedia page of like kind of the history of Audi winners. And for like the first like 15 years, it's almost always all the same names, you know, and, and they're fantastic, but the industry was small. And I think that part of where we are is, uh, you know, witnessing kind of the growth of this, um, witnessing uh, what it looks like when an enormous wave of new narrators arrive sort of after the pandemic. Um, and what that means for, um, not in a competitive sense, but what that means for stories that you've got authors who can write a pretty specific character. And often you're going to be able to find a pretty specific narrator for that character, you know? And I, I think one thing that I really want to see more of too is there's a there's a challenge too of um, an intersectionality in casting. And so uh, I, I run into this a lot as someone who is, queer as someone who is Latino, as someone who is Black as well, that I'm not going to narrate only books that are in those three categories, right? Yeah. Um, and so let's say you get a book and it's about a queer person of color and you're going to put together a small list of narrators and maybe some of them are queer and some of them are of that racial background and a couple of them overlap. Um, and we get to ask those questions of like, what is what does it mean between the author, the text, and the narrator to quote unquote identify the best person for that text? You know, and is it always going to be at the place of overlap? I, th I think we believe that that place of overlap is often smaller than it is. I know there's so many more narrators out there, I think, than we sometimes believe. Um, and in specific contexts, I think in places where everyone involved feels really strongly about how it lends to the story. Um, Sometimes it's not going to be that place of overlap where the best person for that for that story exists. And so I think just having those conversations and you know giving people giving people those opportunities to tell those stories, I think it's great that we're we're seeing more of that. I do too. It makes me feel good. I'm curious though, like where where were you when someone said, or did it happen multiple times? But I'm wondering, like, was there a moment where someone said, you you should do this. You would be really good at this was that a moment or a culmination of many moments it was a bit of a culmination i was i had just moved to new york city in 2019 um before that you know I, before that i had worked my first job out of college uh for two years and it was very much a working in a college setting living on campus it felt like a continuation of college extension yes mm -hmm. yeah and so i moved to new york and I have my first office job that I have to commute to. And I had told myself since college that I didn't like reading because I only really ever read things for classes. My friend recommended this book to me that she really loved. Um, it was The Bone Witch, uh, narrated by Emily Wu Zeller. And she had read the print. And I said to myself, she seems so excited about this, but I don't think I'm going to manage to sit through this and read the text. So let me try an audiobook. Um, and in the next six months, I probably listened to like 25 audiobooks. 
Um, I just started a rampage. <laughs> um, and then, of course, you know, spring comes, the pandemic starts, and I don't remember the exact inciting moment, but I went from being a huge fan to, you know, stumbling onto ACX and finding out that this is something you can apparently do from home. And so I kind of, I started there and and really slowly rolled into this whole this whole journey. Yes, and you have just you have just leveled up and leveled up and leveled up. I mean, I'm sure for you, it has felt like <laughs> I've worked my way through each one of these things. But from the outside, it kind of looks like, wow, Andre just, like you just, you just hit the ground running and took off and made good connections and clearly did good work that got recognized, which must feel really good. Yeah, yeah. I think like, you know, my truth is that there are plenty of ways that I talk down to myself about my work and my own head. You know, I have my own little demons on my shoulder. Um, and in other ways, I think I had parents who instilled me with a lot of like pride and happiness about the work that I do. And so I feel really fortunate to be able to say that I record a book and then I feel really good about the work that I did. Yeah. The last question I like to ask people, if you have another minute, mm -hmm. is the name of the podcast is Desideratum which is Latin for uh, an essential thing. So if you had to explain to somebody, this is something that's essential to me, what would you say? I had an interesting experience in college. There was um, a staff member who was just a fantastic soul and presence on campus um, and would often have lunch with us in the, in the cafeteria. and. There was a day where, you know, she was sitting at my table with a group of folks and she just said, okay, I want to talk to some other people. Like, I'll see y'all later. And just got up and went on her way. And the next time I saw her, I was like, I really want to be you when I grow up. I, I love your energy and I love your honesty. And she was like, why, do, why, do, why would you have to wait? Mm. And I think that has stuck with me. Um, as the kind of core of all, a lot of what guides me through life. And so to answer your question, I think that honesty with yourself feels fundamental to me. It feels important in almost anything we take on. I hope you enjoyed getting to know narrator Andre Santana as much as I did. You can connect with him on social media and on his website. He's andreonthemike.com. Please look for his work in many genres, including the book we featured, Everything the Darkness Eats by Eric LaRocca. I'm audiobook narrator Teresa Bakken. Thanks to Dreamscape Media for sponsoring this episode. And thank you for listening. <laughs>